Hello everyone, this is uh, James Gleason. I'm really excited to be here with my friend Dee Duke. Uh, Dee, you've had a huge impact in my life throughout the years in pastoral ministry, whether it was uh, prayer focus, friendship, mentoring, or Great Commandment Seminar, or all the other ones that uh, you've been a part of. And I'm here specifically to talk to Dee about the question of how their church, Jefferson Baptist, started planting churches. Why did you do that? What was the history behind it? So maybe start with that. What's the backstory behind Jefferson starting all these congregations? I went to a seminar on evangelism, church growth, that kind of stuff down in Los Angeles in 1990. And uh, the statement that was made is that real growth is planting churches, not just adding people. And at the time we were a church of about 200 I made a goal to plant our first church in the year 2000, which was 10 years away. And uh, then I just started selling that to the congregation. And so I have a principle, the bigger the goal, the farther you have to start uh, uh, ahead. And because nobody's afraid of a goal that happens in 10 years. Uh, they don't, there's no resistance to it. No, if you start six months, that big a goal, then it's gonna be a problem. But uh, 10 years away, nobody really thinks they're gonna be alive in 10 years. So. It was no issue. And or you're still going to be the senior pastor in 10 years. Right, right. So, yeah, that was the goal. We were going to plant our first one in 2000, which we did, and then to plant a church every two years after that until we got 10, which were close but not quite there. But anyway. Now, that's pretty aggressive uh, to think every two years, but you've been close. In uh, total, you've planted... Uh, or seven churches are still existing at this point. There were a couple that didn't work out for whatever reasons, which is to be expected. Um, what's your relationship with those seven churches? I mean, you're still the kind of like the father. Is this the mother church? Or are these completely independent churches? What does that look like? The first couple of years after they start, there's a fairly close relationship in the sense of mentoring, helping. Now they're pretty independent, just do their own thing. Um, a column occasionally get together, but there's nothing, uh, not much goes on um, officially other than occasional cup of coffee or lunch and find out how things are going. And, um, and um, when you think about this, I think it's pretty aggressive. It's exciting, but it's pretty aggressive to do this. What has that done for Jefferson as, uh, let's say I'm a congregant here. What does that do for me as a part of a church that's planting churches? Is that a positive thing? Is it a challenging thing? How do I buy into that? Well, it's very, very challenging. Uh, I, I shouldn't probably say this, but hope that some of the people that don't fit well will t leave and be the part of the church planters. And, uh, but it's never that the case. It's always the, the best people, the ones that you know, love a challenge and are aggressive, outreach-oriented that tend to go and do it. So there's a, it's a, a real, it costs a lot in the way of people. Plus, you usually, we usually send a staff person, plus we give them uh, some money. And uh, so it's a, it's a huge challenge. But the, the motivation was it's just like getting people to give. If you give, God blesses. And the more you give, the more He blesses. So even though we're losing people, some really good people, uh, He'll bless and we'll get um, more people back. At least that's what I told everybody. So. <laughs> That's good. And they believed you and they yeah. got behind it. Um, tell us about kind of from the first day a person would walk in or when they're new at JBC, how would they get behind that vision? I mean, you've got a lot of vision, you've got a lot of goals, but wh what would they hear? What would they see to know we're a part of a church that's reaching a bigger kingdom than say just this community in Jefferson? We're doing a new attenders dinner uh, June 4th. And we do one of those three times a year. And anybody that has started attending since the last one or hasn't been to one yet, they come to the dinner. And at the dinner, we show pictures and videos of our history since 1976 when we began. And then we share our main ministries, our vision. And so in that, we'll talk about existing ministries. We'll talk about our church planting. And we'll talk about our missions, four missions stuff primarily. And then we have a follow-up dinner to that. Uh, and we... Uh, we don't deal with the past, we deal with the future then, what our goals are and what we're going to do uh, next year, 10 years from now, where we're headed. 
it's kind of the contract. It's kind of the agreement. Right. You're sharing with them, and if you join us, this is the destination right. of where we're going. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you find that there's opposition to planting churches when you leave? You know, on the table, all the best people, the best money, the best plans, and that walks away. That's got to hurt some of the ministries here, right? When you le- let your worship leader go, or your children's ministry go, or you write a check for fifty thousand dollars or whatever, that costs a lot. Is there any opposition or struggle with that? I really, I people say that must be really exciting. I hated every one of them, uh, in the sense of, I mean, I just the people that were going. I thought, oh wow, this is terrible. It wasn't anything that I was excited about at the time. It's just the concept, the principle that I believe in, based on that faith that indeed we will reap uh, what we've sown. When you think about the average church in America or in the Pacific Northwest, the average conservative Baptist church, uh, they haven't planted churches. It's rare that a church would plant a church. It's even more rare that you would have an intentional, progressive plan to go on a mission to plant churches. Every two years, 10 churches, through that process. What would you say to a pastor or someone watching this who might want to do that, but that's a huge goal. You're a goal guy. You've got lists. I know that. I, I pray through those. Uh, what would you say to try to convince them it's worth the journey? Well, I, I think I would just do the same thing that with people here is that principle of giving, sacrificing, um, you know, we ask people to give financially to our church and depend on that for our, you know, our ministries, etc. And I think sometimes as leaders, we forget that what we receive from people is what we do. In other words, uh, we, uh, we sow and we reap. And so outside our own church walls, giving has to take place and sacrifice has to happen if we expect people inside the church to do the same for us. And I think as pastors, we tend to reap what we sow. And if we tend to be selfish with people and money and don't do it, then we're going to end up with that same kind of results in our own church body. So that's generosity. It's, it's a tithe in a sense. Right. You're tithing to the larger kingdom of God by giving away your first, your best. We've averaged about every five years we plant a congregation. And the analogy I've used is that it's like a mother giving birth. You, you know, you have to space those out or she's really worn out and yeah. she looks at you and says, that's enough, yeah. you know. Um, but two years, that probably creates, uh, I'm going to use the word intensity, but something that is a little more rapid, saying we've got to develop and disciple people quickly. What's your plan for taking uh, a person, young church planter, and actually saying from here to here, here's our plan for you? What does that look like? Well, a lot of them were, like Sam, were on staff, a youth pastor, that, which is great training for that. And so they learn, they pick up the principles and learn hopefully while they're here. Uh, now I'm in the process of mentoring, training, teaching some guys that we're intentionally bringing on for the purpose of uh, equipping them to be church planters, to pastor a church. Uh, it's, going, it's going really well. It's, uh, we're paying for their schooling up through a master's degree. Wow. So that's a big deal for them. And then they meet with me weekly for mentoring, training, goal setting, go through my leadership class. Uh, we have them do things here. The, the, the agreement is they will work 20 hours in the church doing ministry. Then they have a job for uh, their own livelihood. And so we've got six guys on doing, going through it now. So one of the guys that I'm working with, we've just adopted a church about 30 minutes from here that was dying. And they asked us if we would. And so... I'm rotating these guys in over there to preach, uh, and so and working with them on their preaching and uh, and stuff. And so then, and plus, I'm, it's sort of a church plant in that it's on the other side of the river. So I've written a letter to everybody that attends here that lives in that area, saying, "Hey, if you want a little closer church, consider uh, this church." And so about half a dozen families have started attending over there. So they went from ten people, I think, last people a week we had close to fifty. That's great. And so that's a little different than, say, church planting, going right. into a brand new area, because that takes a certain kind of person to start from very little. But like a church revitalization, it's a different kind of, it's like a replant. And so I, I think there are probably a lot more of those on the horizon as the years go by. Yeah, uh, older congregations maybe aging out, uh, not able to afford a senior pastor, losing the energy. 
and getting a younger leader in. Also, bringing in a critical mass of you know, 20, 25 people or more and some funding uh, enough where then they get back on their own. You were telling something to me earlier of what actually happens when a new church goes into a place. It's about reaching brand new people for Christ. Uh, wh why don't you close with that thought that when you see a church go brand new somewhere else, the kingdom in that area is changed because light has brought in. People who are church individuals tend to look for uh, ministry, things to meet their needs. They don't go to churches meeting in school gyms and uh, uh, that don't have all the things to offer. Uh, they tend to go to churches that got youth groups, they're all set up, they got comfortable pews, uh, they got counseling services. And so that's the non-churched individuals that are looking for something that'll tend to go to a church plant because uh, they don't care about that. And they, it's not that they don't care, they just haven't had any experience to know what to look for. So they just, the, the new church attracts unchurched people much. They don't have the same expectations as right. a, a, a churchgoer who moves in. I think that's an important point because they are reaching lost people for Christ. If you study the whole church planting thing is that new churches almost always grow faster than existing churches because they just have a, uh, it's sort of selfish, I guess, they want to survive. Well, they need some people. Yeah. And so the people who go, uh, they have that mindset that, that to plant it. They're, they're already outreach oriented. And so they be, tend to be the ones that invite and that uh, do the work and they're aggressive. And so you plant a new church, it's a little struggling church. They usually will, uh, you know, the, the accumulative effect of planting churches is much greater than the mother church. And if had we kept them, what we would be today compared with what we are now as a, as a collection of churches is, I don't think, even close. New churches reach new people. Right. And uh, not that you can't reach a lot of people here, but what a great kingdom mindset. So I want to thank you for taking time with us.